So what's your perception of me? That you try very hard. Thank you. <laughs> that is my perception. But I mean, even just since arriving here, right? Like you've got nervous energy mm -hmm. and then you can see in like the, the pace of your, of your breathing and the pace of your speaking that, that you also have some nervous energy going on. I'm really excited to talk to you. But the, one of the first questions I was gonna ask you, you kind of hit it on the head. How do I stop this from happening in the future for future guests? When there's a high level of excitement, usually it's because there's a high level of anticipation. Mm -hmm. There's something, there's a story essentially that you're kind of telling yourself whether that person is so cool or that person is so smart. So what's happening is momentum of your energy front load the actual experience itself. So the same thing happens when you have a guest on your show. The same thing happens if you're getting ready for a big interview. Journalists have to suffer this all the time, right? Imagine being a journalist that gets, a conver gets to have an interview with Putin mm. or a journalist that gets to sit down with Biden. That's not the kind of thing that you get to do every two weeks, mm -hmm. right? So there's all this, this anticipation and this anticipatory energy that they have to overcome so that they don't start the interview strong or with high energy and then end the interview low. Is there, are there methods to prevent that? Yes. So what you have to do is you basically have to inocul inoculate yourself against the momentum of energy. Sometimes okay. we call it stress inoculation. So there's two types of stress, mental, like brain stress. There's, there's distress okay. and there's eustress. Mm. Distress is the stress that we all know a little like and hate mm -hmm. the, the loathing and the not looking forward to something and the, the feeling like the world is crushing you down that's all distress you stress is all the positive stress like when there's change that results in more energy or when there's anticipation or when there's some sort of enthusiasm mm. that's also stressful like mm -hmm. it increases your heart rate increases your cortisol levels increases your body temperature it's the same effect as normal stress but it has a different cognitive impact because of how it how it triggers more energy in a different way. So you have to stress inoculate against what you're getting ready to do. So for example, uh, you can role play. I'm interviewing Putin next week. Can you pretend to be Putin? Ah, uh, so you like practice the intro. And then you sit with them and you're like, I'm gonna start with this question and then this question and this question. If your role player is very good at being a role player, which many people need some practice, right? Mm -hmm. But if they're very good at being a role player, they will put themselves into the role because they know that it's helping you. And then if you go through three, five, 12 practice questions, two or three different intros, by the time Putin actually walks through the door, you're like, oh, you're just kind of a funny little man <laughs> instead of this larger than life character. Yeah. Okay. So role playing would be the number one suggestion. Role playing is the number one suggestion. And then the number two is actually to rehearse, rehearse out loud. It can be into the mirror. It can be into the, into the absolute ether, the, the darkness of your room, whatever you want. Because what happens is there's a, there's a brain mouth muscle connection. Mm that often people overlook. Why are soccer players good at soccer? They have, they have muscle memory. Why are football, well, football and soccer, depending on what country you're in the same. <laughs> why is American football, why are American football players so good at American football? Why are tennis players so good at tennis? Why are golfers so good at golf? Part of it is because of muscle memory. Their body, their hands, their arms, their shoulders, their hips, remember the motion, the movement, the stroke, the mm. position, right? That's just muscle memory, training over and over again. We have the same problem with our mouths. If you don't know what question you're going to say, or if you know what question you're gonna say, but you've never practiced, practiced yeah. saying it out loud, there is no mind muscle connection for your lips. Mm. So you can stumble over yourself, you can say it too fast. When you see people clarify over and over again, often it's because they know they're not being clear. Mm -hmm. So you gotta build that routine. So when you have a role player, you do both skills at once, mm -hmm. right? You inoculate against the stress and you build the brain mouth muscle connection. If you don't have a role player, you can't inoculate against the stress, but you can still build the brain mouth muscle connection. Interesting. So a lot like a presentation, you'd want to go before you go on a stage, you just want to do the same process. So then how, since you, but this is a one-on-one -on -one conversation. So you're almost, you need to practice what you're going to ask. This is a formal interview, but if you're, I guess you could still practice if you're going up to a girl <laughs> before, oh, for sure. before you talk to her. What's funny is if you've ever met pickup artists, uh -huh. have you ever met an actual pickup uh -huh. artist, like real Pickup artists, people who pride themselves on the art of pickup, uh -huh. do all the things that we're talking about. They role play with their boys. They practice lines. They practice mm. pickups. They practice. Like, and they do some research ahead of time to know absolutely. what to Absolutely. <laughs> they have like go-to <laughs> tricks and tools. It's, it's, it sounds ridiculous, mm -hmm. except that it works. If it, mm -hmm. if it didn't work, it would make the practice ridiculous. But because mm -hmm. it works, the practice, therefore, is not so ridiculous. Interesting. So if you do meet the person and you got past your rehearsed scene, how would you go ahead and gain perspective on that person, that individual? The whole reason that you practice beforehand is because let's say you practice five questions, right? This is something that we call a conversation map. 
Okay. If you imagine, uh, you've seen like, you've seen people create flow charts mm -hmm. in the past, right? Like you do this and it goes to this, it goes to that. And then you have a yes, no situation. If they say yes, it goes this direction. Mm -hmm. If they say no, it goes this yeah. direction. You've seen flow charts. For sure. A conversation map is a tool that we use in intelligence collection that is essentially a flow chart for a conversation. Interesting. So I ask you the question, hey, how's your day going? Good. There's really only two yeah. options, right? There's, there's some sort of positive response. It's good, I'm happy, right? Or there's some sort of negative response. Oh, it sucks, it's horrible. When you actually build a conversation map, you can also like scope out the fact, oh, probably a 70% chance you're gonna say it's good, even if it's not good, because mm -hmm. culturally we say it's good. 20% chance you're gonna say it's bad. Well, there's still 10% not accounted for. So then we also have to build out the neutral response. What if you get a neutral response? What if you get a response like, I'm not sure yet, or I'll find out later. Like, that's an unexpected response that still has some probability of occurring. Mm -hmm. Well, if you only plan, if, first of all, if you don't plan for the conversation at all, after you ask the first question, you're, you're done. Just, yeah. <laughs> yeah, how's your day? It's good. Uh, okay, <laughs> I don't know what to say next. Yeah. So a conversation map gives you the opportunity to know exactly what you're gonna say next in all three situations. Mm. So if you say, oh, my day is good, then my next step in the conversation map is going to be like, what makes it good? If you say your day sucks, my next step in the conversation map is going to be like, oh, I'm sorry to hear that. What makes it bad? If your answer is something neutral, maybe my next step in the, in the conversation map is to say, oh, what would make it a better day? Mm. Now, I am two, I'm now two questions ahead mm -hmm. of your responses. Mm -hmm. If I can build myself three, four, five questions ahead, which is surprisingly easy, when you actually think about it, when you literally draw it on a piece of paper, Here's my first question, draw it in a circle. Here are the two or three most likely responses. Here are the two or three most likely responses from each of those, and et cetera, et cetera. You can get about five questions deep. The reason you do that is so that when you actually meet the person and you start the conversation map, you only need 30% of your mental capacity to keep up with the mm. conversation. The other 70% is going into what we call personal assessment, mm. which is creating the baseline about that person's behavior in that moment in time. So then by the time you get through question four and five and you've got five responses worth of input, now you start making up new questions. Now you start engaging in what we would call a deliberate dialogue, an exchange of information. And through that process, now you have more information about the other person because you've got all of their data that they've shared, plus all of your assessment data that you've picked up through their tone and their physical movements and their body language. Let's say that we're talking to somebody that we met at a fundraising event and we went to that fundraising event specifically so we could network with business leaders and community leaders. Okay. All right. So, so you already know going into that room what time of day it is. It's probably nighttime. You know that they're going to have hors d'oeuvres and a meal. You know, you're going to be, everyone's going to be there for probably two and a half to three hours because mm -hmm. it's a fundraiser. There's going to be speakers on stage. There's going to be music. There's going to be tables. There's going to be all this stuff. Everybody's dressed in suits, ties, or something that they think looks like relatively formal wear, fashionable mm -hmm. formal wear. So that's the scenario. Okay. Let's build the first five questions. All right. The first question is very, is very likely going to be either hello or something that about an introduction, because that's why everybody's there. So your first question might actually be, hi, my name's Andy, or hi, my name's Adam, right? Hi, my name's Andy. I am with Everyday Spy. You know, what are you doing here? You have no idea who the person is, right? Mm -hmm. But you do know that in this room, you're going to have to talk to people and people are there to talk to people. So you know that you can get away with a conversation starter that's something as simple as, my name's Andy, what's your name? So one response is they're going to say their name. Mm -hmm. What's another response? You say, who are you? Yeah, so yeah. my name's Andy, I'm with Everyday Spy. I ho I'm the host of the party, like a different, like a category There's, of way of explaining themselves. So this is, this is why a conversation mm -hmm. map is so powerful, right? Mm -hmm. We all assume that they're going to answer our question. Mm. Some people won't, right? Some people might say something like, oh, I'm nobody. I'm just here with my wife. Aha, uh -huh, okay. Right? Oh, oh I'm, I'm, I'm nobody. I'm just, I'm a driver. Mm -hmm. oh, you, you don't have to, I'm not anybody important, man. I'm just the waiter, mm -hmm. right? Oh, I'm here with, I'm part of the sound team, right? Mm. You might get a response like that. So you have to have a planned response for that, mm. right? So you've got the, the, the peer response, essentially. Oh, I'm Brett. I'm a YouTuber. <laughs> Oh, cool. Now we're past the first question. Mm -hmm. Then you've got the person that's like, oh, you don't want to talk to me, man. I'm nobody. I'm just, the, I'm just Joe's driver. Mm -hmm. You have to have a plan for that kind of response too. And then you also have to have the response for somebody who's being like unexpected, snarky, 
uh, somebody who's being funny. I don't know how many comedians you know, but a lot of times they will turn a situation on their head mm. just to freak you out, right? So they'll be like, none of your business. What's your name? You've got to have at least those three responses planned for. Otherwise, you're going to get wigged out. But you're choosing these based on the social situation. And since that's a and networking the, event. And the probability. That would be, okay, huh. So it's most probable in a networking event mm -hmm. that people are going to be cooperative. That's interesting. It's also possible at a networking event that you'll talk to somebody who's part of the event staff mm -hmm. or part of the secondary staff. Mm -hmm. It's also possible that you'll talk to somebody who's trying to be countercultural because that is their tool for networking. So mm -hmm. you have to, and there's, a, there's five or seven or 12 other circumstances that might happen too, but let's be ready for those three. I don't think you have to be ready for the person who's like, who doesn't speak English. Because that mm -hmm. person might be there too. I don't think you have to be ready for the person who's got a stomach ache, but that person might be there too, right? Those are all lower probabilities. It's not worth planning for that outcome. But now we're, we're only one question deep into this, mm -hmm. right? Who are you? Mm -hmm. Now we find out their name. So now what's your next question? So if you find out that somebody's, if, if you plan for a positive peer response, hi, my name's uh, Andy, or my name's Brett, or my name's John, or my name's Jake, or Adam, or whatever else. Hi, that's my name. Okay, what's our next question for that person? But also, what's our next question for the person who says, I'm nobody? And what's our next question for the person who says, aren't you being nosy? Who are you? Mm -hmm. like, what's our next response in each of those three cases? Mm. And you're just mapping it out based off of the complete environment you're going into. So let's, let's go through the exercise. Okay, okay. Let's just do it. Just do two or three questions. But now you're so, seeing it's not yeah, an yeah. easy process. So if it's your name, you could say, how are you doing? Okay. Second one could be, do you like the job or what do you specifically do? Get interested in them. Mm -hmm. And then the third one could be, I don't know, you'd probably have to be quick. I don't even know. <laughs> yeah, that one be hard. And I, I want to be ready for that. Yeah. Now you're understanding why it is that intelligence officers spend so much time planning before mm -hmm. they ever put themselves in an operation. Mm. Right? Because in, here's what's interesting. All three of those potential outcomes from the first question, I'm Andy, mm -hmm. who are you? All three outcomes could be people of interest. Gotcha. Right? What if it's the driver of, like we're in Phoenix right now. What if it's the driver of the governor of Phoenix? Now you are one step removed from the governor of Phoenix. What if it's the driver to the CEO of Boeing Air, uh, Aerospace? Now you're one step removed from the CEO of Boeing Aerospace. Like these are, these are important people. Mm -hmm. They may not think they're important. They might think they're just a waiter or a driver or a gardener or whatever else. Their access. Interesting. They, you have no other way of getting to the Boeing CEO in your network than that person right now. So you've got to be prepared to maximize that opportunity with that person. We have a saying at CIA, we say, everybody is worth a cup of coffee. Everybody's worth a cup of coffee. It's one of the big reasons why whenever I get an invitation to be on a podcast, I don't just say no, mm -hmm. because everybody's worth a cup of coffee. You never know what that person might say, do, or be connected to in some way that can benefit or help or assist you now or in the future. So you've got to give everybody a shot. You've got to give everybody equal treatment. You can't just go someplace thinking, I am only here to talk to the super hot blonde chicks. That's it. They have to be, you know, between 25 and 28 years old, and they have to be like platinum blonde with long hair past their shoulders, and they have to be dressed to impress. For all you know, like, it's the brunette who's at that party who's funny and giggly and whatever else, mm -hmm. whose best friend outside of that party is exactly what you're looking for. Ah, so you're going to limit your future options too. Correct. It's, there's an opportunity cost mm -hmm. to what you choose to do right now. Okay, fascinating. The coolest thing you just said was that when you, were, you do this, not just to be prepared and have a good impression, but so you can limit processing power in your brain, so then you can actually like kind of try to read their emotional state, pick up on their ideals, and try to see if they're anxious looking over their shoulder. You're trying to get completely different reads so it limits your ability to worry about those initial few conversations. Correct. What you're doing is you're front loading your, your uh, repetitive tasks so that you can leave space to process through real time tasks. Mm. And there's so much that we do that's repetitive. Most conversations that we yeah. have are repetitive. So why, why make, why let ourselves mm. use our active RAM, if you will, mm -hmm. to process through simple shit mm -hmm. instead, save the RAM for the good shot, the good stuff. And then like just use, automate the other stuff, make, You've got tons of, of brain, mouth, muscle memory for things like, how are you? What's your name? Mm -hmm. How's your day? That shit's automatic. Nobody stutters over those words. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So most people in the world are self-interested. I'd say everybody is self-interested. And so a lot of times they're going into these conversa conversations thinking about like what's in it for themselves. And I think the CIA has kind of identified that in human beings. 
studied it, mastered it, and now weaponizes it against people in a way for their benefit. Yeah. <laughs> I'm really objective. I, I want to have the most like objective conversation with you. And if I feel like I'm going to say things that are going to come off like really like not okay in the world, but Go I feel like it. this is how the CIA talks. And so I would much rather be as like objective as possible here. Like you guys are trained to get your desired outcome from a human being, get Correct. information out of them Correct. and use tactics and use their psychology against them. Pe yeah. So you're, you're using words like weaponize and against. You're using these very um, incendiary or alarmist mm -hmm. terms. Alarmist, huh? Because think about, think about what it feels like to be the person who's hearing the words that you're saying, mm -hmm. right? Use it against you. Well, against implies that it's not in your best interest. It's not in the target's best mm -hmm. interest. And against also impl implies that it's against the will of the target. So everybody makes fun of car salespeople, right? Car salesmen. But in reality, people want to buy cars. Mm -hmm. Like nobody walks into a car dealership <laughs> not fucking wanting to buy a car. Yeah. So why is it that the salespeople have such a negative reputation of being like slimy and scammy and tricky and all this other stuff for somebody who wants to buy the thing that they showed up to buy? It's, it's not that the salesperson is scammy or slimy. It's that the sales process mm -hmm. rubs the, the, the target right? The, the would-be consumer or customer, the sales process rubs the customer the wrong way. It makes the customer feel like they don't have control. It makes the customer feel like they have to acquiesce. It makes the customer feel like they have to compromise. That's how anybody who has, anybody who's ever wanted to buy XYZ car and ends up buying ABC car instead, that's why they're so disappointed. That's why there's buyer's remorse. What CIA has done is mastered the process of finding somebody who wants to buy XYZ car and then selling them XYZ car in as fast and as productive and as positive a way as possible. Because what CIA knows is if you help them buy one car once and it's fast, it's efficient and it's fun, guess what happens the next time they want to buy a car? You go to you. Every single time. And so right? you want them to feel happy about giving you information. So the whole idea of weaponizing their personality against them uh -huh. It's exactly the opposite of what we do. We don't let them know that, but in a way, like, so it's like, I see people around in my life, like they're just completely emotionally manipulating each other back and forth, back and forth in relationships. I do this. That means you have to buy me this thing. You right. bought me this thing. Now that means you have to let me play a video game tonight or whatever it right, is, right, right. but they don't, aren't aware of it. And so the CIA is just hyper aware of what X leads to Y and Y leads to Z through a psych psychology map, basically. Of yeah, because you're totally right. P people go through life doing what we call, they have reactive conversations. Okay. Right, they have reactive relationships. Meaning, like, I'm friends with you for some reason, <laughs> and you're friends with me for some reason. Yeah, it's but mutually we've, beneficial. But we've probably not even talked about what that reason is. Yeah. Right? Am I friends with you because you're funny and you're cool and you like the same video games? Maybe, but chances are that's not the real reason mm -hmm. why I like being around you. The real reason is probably something like, you, I don't feel like you judge me. Mm. Or the real reason is because you also have a job that starts at 11 o'clock at night. So you're like the only person <laughs> I can hang out with at two o'clock in the, in the yeah. afternoon who's not at a job. Like it's, it's very real. Just like you said, we all operate in our own self-interest. The reason that we're friends in some way, shape or form is tied to my self-interest. So all CIA does is it says, hey, pause, time out. In a reactive conversation or a reactive relationship between two people, the person who stops reacting and starts observing is going to be the person who is in control of the rest of that relationship or the rest of that conversation. If you stay reactive, there's two risks. The first risk is that it's never efficient. So you, you lose all this opportunity because it's not efficient. Mm -hmm. But the bigger risk is that the other person is the one that's going to stop reacting and start observing first. Mm. And once that happens, they're in control. So what CIA does is it just says, hey, this is simple. There's, there's really only two outcomes. You're either in control or you're out of control. Mm -hmm. It's up to you which one you want to be.